introduction to alexander the great the story of this drama is derived from quintus curtius plutarch and justin the real hero is porus rather than alexander and when it was first acted in sixteen sixty five mention is made of it under the former title racine himself writes thus i have endeavoured to represent in porus an enemy worthy of alexander and i may say that his character has met with a high degree of public favour and some have even censured me for making this prince greater than alexander but such persons forget that in virtue of his victory alexander is really greater than porus that every line of the tragedy reflects his praises and that even the invectives of porus and axiana are so many tributes to the conqueror's valour there is perhaps in porus something that interests us more from the very circumstance of his misfortunes for as seneca has remarked we are naturally disposed to admire nothing in the world so much as a man who can bear adversity with courage characters alexander read by ron altman porus indian king read by todd taxiles indian king read by ethan hurst axiana queen of another part of india read by matea bracic cleophila sister of taxiles read by abai hephaestion read by chris pyle stage directions read by sonia the scene is laid on the banks of the hydaspus in the camp of taxiles alexander the great a tragedy act one scene one taxiles cleophila what go you to resist a king whose might seems to force heaven itself to take his side before whose feet have fallen all the kings of asia who holds fortune at his beck open your eyes my brother and behold in alexander one who casts down thrones binds kings in chains and makes whole nations slaves and all the ills they have incurred prevent would you that stricken with so mean a fear i bow my head to meet his threatening yoke and hear it said by every indian tribe i forge the fetters for myself and them shall i leave porus and betray those chiefs met to defend the freedom of our realms who without hesitation have declared their brave resolve to live or die like kings see you a single one of them so cowed at alexander's name that he forgets to fight and begs to be enrolled his slave as of the acknowledged master of the world so far from being daunted at his fame they will attack him e'en in victory's lap and would you sister have me crave his help whom i to-day am ready to withstand nay is it not to you this prince appeals sues for your friendship and for yours alone and ready to discharge his lightning flash makes secret efforts to protect your head why should he spare his wrath for me alone of Aladaspe's arms against him how have i deserved a pity that insults why not to porus make these overtures doubtless he deems him too magnanimous to heed an offer that is fraught with shame and seeking virtue of less stubborn mould thinks me forsooth more worthy of his care say not he thinks to find in you a slave but deems you bravest of his enemies and hopes that may he but disarm your hand his triumph or the rest will be secured his choice does no discredit to your name he offers friendship cowards may not share though he would fain see all the world submit to him he wants no slave among his friends ah if his friendship can your glory soil you spared me not a stain of deeper dye you know his daily services to me why did you ne'er attempt to check their course you see me now the mistress of his heart a hundred secret missives make me sure of his devotion and to reach me come his ardent sighs across two hostile camps instead of urging hatred and disdain you oft have blamed me for severity you led me on to listen to his suit ay and perchance to love him in my turn you have no need to blush the charms so rare have forced that mighty warrior to succumb nor should it cause alarm that he whose power has dried euphrates can disarm your heart but with my destiny our country's fate is linked and it must follow as i lead and though you fain would turn me from the task i must be free to guard her liberties i know how this my purpose gives you pain but I, like you, follow the star of love. 
fair Axiana's danger-darting eyes against your Alexander aim their shafts. Queen of all hearts, she bids her subjects arm for freedom, which her charms alone must bind. She hears with shame threats of captivity, nor brooks another tyrant than herself. Her wrath, my sister, must command my sword, and I must go. Ah, well, destroy yourself to please her. What though fatal the decree, obey so dear a despot if you will, or rather let your rival reap your bays. Go fight for Porus, Axiana calls, secure for him the empire of her heart, for your best valour will not make her bend. Thank you, the Porus, sister. Can you doubt yourself that Axiana loves him? What? Can you not see how eager is her praise as she parades his deeds before your eyes? Though others may be brave, round him alone, believe me, victory's pinions seem to wave. Without his sanction, vain your wisest plans. Only with him rests India's liberty. Had he not interposed, our walls ere now had sunk in ashes. He alone can stop the conqueror's march. This charming prince she makes her god, and, though you doubt it, fain would make her lover. I have tried to doubt it. Uh. Be not so cruel as to blast all hope, nor paint a picture that I hate to see. Nay, help me rather to be blind. Confirm my pleasing error. Pride befits the fair. Tell me she treats all others e'en as me, and save me from despair. With my consent, hope still, but nothing more expect from sighs too weak to move her. Why in battle seek a conquest Alexander offers you himself? "'Tis not with him you have to cope, but Porus, who would rest a prize so fair. Fame, too unjust to others' merit, vaunts his exploits. None but his forgets the rest. Whate'er is done, he the sole credit claims, and leads you like his subjects to the field. Ah, if that title has a pleasing sound, why not with Greeks and Persians range yourself beneath a worthier lord?' A hundred kings will share your bonds. Porus himself will come. Yes, the whole world. But Alexander keeps no chains for you. He leaves upon your brow the crown a haughty rival dares disdain. Tis Porus, and not he, makes you a slave. Be not his victim when tis in your power. But look, here comes your generous rival. Ah, my sister, how my heart beats in alarm and tells me as I look that he is loved. Time presses. Fare you well. With you it lies to be his slave, or Alexander's friend. Scene 2. Porus, Taxilus. Sir, I am much deceived, or our proud foes will make less progress than they reckoned on. Impatient of delay, our gallant troops show resolution stamped upon their brows. Strengthen each other's hearts, and none too young to promise himself victorious bays. From rank to rank the martial ardor spreads, and eager cries have burst upon mine ears, complaining that they cannot prove their zeal, but waste their vigor in an idle camp. Shall we allow such courage to be lost? Our wily foe knows where advantage lies, feeling himself still weak to hold us back, he sends Hephaestion hither, who demands a parley, that, by idle words, "'Tis fit to hear him, sir. We know not yet what terms are offered. Alexander may wish peace. Peace? Would you then accept it at his hands? Have we not seen him with repeated blows disturb the happy calm we erst enjoyed? And sword in hand enter these realms of ours, attacking kings who ne'er offended him? Have we not seen him laying countries waste, our rivers swollen with our subjects' blood? Yet, when the gods have placed him in our power, am I to wait until the tyrant deigns to pardon? Say not heaven forsakes his cause. With constant care it still defends his head. A monarch at whose nod so many states tremble is not a foe for kings to scorn. I scorn him not. His courage I admire, and to his prowess render due respect. But I, too, am ambitious to deserve the tribute which his merits force from me. Let Alexander be upraised to heaven, yet will I pluck him thence, if so I may. 
the altars which men's trembling hands have reared to this terrestrial god will I attack. E'en thus did Alexander treat those kings whose provinces now own his greater sway. If, when he entered Asia, he had quailed, Darius would not with his parting breath have hailed him king. Sir, had Darius known how weak he was, he would be reigning now where reigns another. But his fatal pride was better founded than your present scorn. The fame of Alexander had not yet burst like the lightning from behind the clouds. Darius never had heard his name before, and calmly dreamed of easy victory. He knew him soon, and all amazed beheld his countless hosts scattered like chaff, himself crushed to the earth by a victorious arm, the lightning as it fell unsealed his eyes. What price, too, think you, shall one have to pay for swallowing this bait of shameful peace? A hundred different tribes can tell you, sir, how, grossly cheated, peace for them meant chains. Be not deceived, his smiles are treacherous. His proffered friendship leads to slavery for ever. No half-service will avail. Submit to bondage, or remain his foe. To turn from rashness is not cowardice. A harmless homage may be all he claims. With flattering words sue this ambitious prince, till lust of conquest summon him elsewhere. For like a mountain torrent he sweeps by, and overwhelms all that arrest his course. Gorged with the wrecks of many multitudes, the roar of mighty waters fills the world. What boots it to let surely pride provoke his wrath? With favorable welcome hail his march, and waive those rights we may resume hereafter, nor refuse what cost us not. What costs us not? Dare you believe it, sir? And shall I count as nothing honor lost? The coward's brand is far too dear a price at which we may redeem our diadems. But think you that a prince so bold and proud can pass this way and leave no trace behind? How many monarchs, wrecked upon this reef, retain their titles but to please his pride? Should we once crouch his vassals, we should find our crowns no more sit firmly on our heads. Should we displease him, from our nerveless hands would drop our scepters at his slightest breath. Say not, he marches on from land to land, and leaves them as they were. The Nazi ties bind princes fast, and oft times in the dust he seeks fit instruments to govern slaves. But such mean cares touch not my firm resolve. Your interest alone inspires my words. Horace declines to treat of terms of peace, when glory speaks no other voice he hears. I hear what honor bids as well as you. To save my country is what she commands. Save her and honor too. This day forestall the invader. Let us march to meet his arms. Contempt and rashness are unfaithful guides. Shame follows hard upon a timid soul. Kings who can save their subjects earn their love but honored more when they know how to reign. Such counsel finds response from pride alone. Yet kings will heed it, aye, and queens perchance. The queen has eyes, it seems, for none but you. A slave she marks with anger and contempt. But think you, sir, tis love that would expose her people and herself along with you? Nay, tell yourself the naked truth. Confess your guiding light as hatred and not love. I readily will own that righteous wrath makes me love war as much as you love peace, that burning with a noble fire I go to measure swords against Alexander's pride. The praises of his valor vex my soul, which long has panted for this happy day. Ere he was on my track my spirit rose, resentful, and in secret hated him. With keen impatience and fierce jealousy I thought his near approach too long delayed, and drew him hither with such warm desires as made me wish myself on Persian soil to meet him sooner. Should he balk me now, and seek to leave these regions, then would I dispute in arms his passage, and refuse the peace he condescends to offer us. So high a spirit and so firm a heart, augur a glorious place in history's page. And should you sink beneath the bold attempt, your fall at least will throw the world resound. Farewell. The queen draws near. Display that zeal, that pride which makes your merit in her eyes. My presence would disturb your interview, and my faint-hearted prudence makes a blush. Scene three. Porus, Axiana. What? 
Taxiles avoids me? Why is this? Ah, he does well to hide from you his shame. No longer daring to encounter risk, how could he bear to look you in the face? But let us leave him, madam, to his choice. He and his sister go to pay their vows to Alexander. Let us leave a camp where Taxilus, with incense in his hand, awaits his sovereign. But what says he, sir? Betrays too much. Already does this slave boast of the bondage he would have me share. Be not so passionate, and let me try to stop him. Though discouraged, his warm sighs assure me of his love. Howe'er that be, let me try speech with him again, nor force that purpose into action by your scorn, which hardly can be fixed. What? Doubt you that? And will you trust a faithless lover's heart, who to a tyrant means this very day to give you up, thinking thereby to win your hand from him? Well, if you will, assist your own betrayal. He may seize the prize I deemed my own, but still it shall be mine to fight and die for you. This glory mocks his jealous efforts. Think you then my love shall be the meed of insolence so base, and that my heart, submitting to his sway, could e'er consent to be disposed of thus? Can you impute such crime without a blush? When have I shown him partiality? Were I to choose between Taxiles and you, how can you think that I could hesitate? Know I not well how his unstable soul is swayed alternately by love and fear? And were it not for me, his timid heart would soon be vanquished by his sister's wiles. Made Alexander's captive, as you know, she afterwards returned to Taxiles. But soon I found she meant to fasten him in the same trap which had ensnared her heart. And can you live beside her after that? Why not abandon her to guilt and crime? Why be so anxious now to spare a prince? For your sake I would win him. Shall I see you overwhelmed with care for our defence, and left alone to attack so strong a foe? I would have Taxiles combine his arms with yours, in spite of all his sister's plots. Would that your zeal could spare some thought for me. But such considerations are too mean to move you. So that you may nobly fall, you little care what follows, nor provide refuge for me from Alexander's wrath, or from your rival's love, who, treating me soon as his humble captive, will demand my heart and hand as purchased by your blood. Well, go, my lord, fulfil your eager wish, think only of the conflict, and forget to guard your life, forget how heaven had smoothed the way that might have led to happiness. It may be Axiana in her turn was well disposed to go. But nay, depart to lead your army. We have talked too long, and you are weary of detainment here. Stay, madam. See how earnest is my flame. Order my life, and make my soul your own. Glory, I own it, has much influence there, but what can charm so matchless not perform? I will forget what plans we form to join our forces to risk all against the foe, that Porus deemed it happiness supreme alone to triumph in his rival's eyes. I say no more. Proclaim your sovereign will, and fame and hatred both shall bow to you. Fear naught. The heart which will so well obey is not in the hands that can betray their trust. Its glory is too much my care to wish to stop a hero bent on victory. Hasten your steps to meet the enemy, but do not part yourself from your allies. Control them gently, and with tranquil mind leave me to try my skill on Taxiles. Let milder sentiments towards him prevail. I undertake to make him fight for you. Well, go then, madam. I consent with joy. And let us see Hephaestion, since we must, but without losing a hope of following close. I wait Hephaestion, then the battlefield. End of Act One Act Two, Scene One Cleophila, Hephaestion. Yes, while your kings together hold debate until the council meets, lady, let me tell you what secret reasons bring me here. I, as the friend to whom my lord confides the flame which your eyes kindled, 
would to them reveal it, and entreat you to extend to him the peace which he would grant your kings. After so many sighs, what may he hope? Your brother gives consent, yet you delay. Why let your lover, doubtful and perplexed, his heart ne'er offer but with constant dread of your refusal? Must he at your feet lay all the world that's left? Give peace, make war. Which shall it be? Command. His feet will run, by conquest or by merit to prevail. May I believe a prince of fame so high still keeps the memory of my feeble charms? That he who makes terror and victory his followers should condescend to sigh for me? Such captives break their chain full soon, to grandest projects glory leads them on, and love within their breasts, hindered and crushed, is neath a weight of laurels soon overwhelmed. So long as I his prisoner remained, I might have made some slight impression there. But, sir, I fancy when he loosed my bonds, the hero in his turn soon burst his own. Ah, had you seen him chafing at delays, counting the days that kept you from his sight. Love you would own was urging on his steps. He rushed to battle, but in search of you. Tis you who lead the conqueror of kings. Thus through your provinces to march in haste, and rend upon his way neath his strong arm all obstacles that hinder his approach. Now on the self-same plain our banners wave with yours. He views your ramparts from his own, and after all his exploits, fear subdues the victor's heart, lest it should still be far from yours. His rapid strides from land to land have served him not, if you against him bar that heart and daily doubt his constancy to excuse the harshness that makes no responses to faithful vows with weapons of distrust your mind. Alas, how weak the best defense against such doubts! Our hearts we vainly vex with reasons to suspect what most they wish. Would your lord read the secret of my soul? Tis with delight I hear how much he loves. I feared that time had made his passion ebb. I fain would have his heart and that for a. I will say more. When he our frontier forced, and within Omphis took me prisoner, when I beheld him master of the world, to be his captive seemed a privilege, and far from murmuring against my fate, its sweetness grew with custom, I will own, till freedom was a memory erased, recovery of which I claimed, yet feared. Think how I must rejoice at his return. But would he have me see him blood be sprent? Comes he to show himself an enemy? Is it not for torture that he seeks me out? No, madam. Vanquished by your potent charms, he veils the terrors of his flashing sword. He offers peace to kings whose eyes are blind. The hand that could have crushed them he withdraws. He fears lest victory, too easy prize. My point is weapons to your brother's breast. His courage shrinks from causing you a pang nor covets laurels sprinkled with your tears. Prosper the anxious care his love inspires, save him from winning sorrowful success, and influence monarchs whom his mercy spares to accept a boon they owe to you alone. Ah, oh, doubt it not, my agitated soul, with just alarm is ceaselessly distressed. I tremble for my brother, lest his blood should stain the hand of enemy so dear. But vainly I oppose his fiery zeal, Horus and Axiana rule his soul. A king's example and a queen's bright eyes rise up against me when I try to speak. When harassed thus, what have I not to dread? I fear for him, for Alexander too. I know he has destroyed a hundred kings who dared defy him. Well, his feats I know, but I know Porus, under whose command our people have repulsed and triumphed our Scythian and Mede, and, proud of former bays, will follow him to victory or death. I fear... Nay, harbor not a fear so vain. Let Porus rush, whither disaster leads. Let India, in his cause, arm all her states, and let your brother only hold aloof. But here they come. Accomplish your good work. Your wisdom may disperse these angry clouds, 
or if the storm must burst be this your care to make it fall on other heads than ours scene two porus taxilus hephaestion ere the fierce conflict that looms threateningly adds to our many conquests all your states my lord is willing to suspend his stroke and for the last time offers terms of peace your people prepossessed with flattering hopes the victor of euphrates thought to stay in spite of all your squadrons scattered wide hydaspes sees at length our standards float along his banks which o'er your trenches soon would stand while native blood your fields bedewed did not our hero crowned with other bays himself the ardor of his warriors check he comes not hither stained with princely gore by barbarous triumph to affright these realms and from your ruin reaping bright renown o your king's tombs victorious trophies raise but be not ye yourselves deceived by hope elusive nor provoke your own defeat ere his resistless hand descends in wrath delay no longer you have done enough already in withholding homage due such as your hearts must own his valor claims welcome the firm support his arm affords and honor the protector of your states such is the message he is pleased to send ready to drop the sword or take it up you know his purpose make your choice this day to lose your crowns or hold them as from him sir think not that a rude and sullen pride forbids us such rare virtue to respect and that our people with presumptuous zeal will be your enemies in spite of you we render to true greatness all that's meet you worship gods that owe us to their fanes heroes who'd passed with you for mortal men have met with votive altars among us but vain would be the attempt to make our tribes change their free worship into slavery trust me the glory moves them to adore no incense will they offer on constraint how many other states subdued by you have seen their sovereigns bend beneath the yoke after all these is it not time enough that alexander should look out for friends these captives trembling at their master's name but ill support a power so newly born they have their eyes open to every chance of freedom your dominions are all are full of hidden foes they weep their kings discrowned in secret and your chains too widely stretched grow slack the scythians mutinous at heart already soon will burst the bonds to which you destine us try taking for a pledge our friendship whether faith no oath constraints can bind us leave a people free who know how freely to applaud your famous deeds i take your master's friendship on these terms and i await him as a monarch may a hero on whose steps glory attends who wins my heart but cannot touch my throne i thought when gathering his provinces hydapses saw us flocking to protect his banks from outrage that for task so great there came no kings with me but such as were the foes of tyrants but since one is found to lick the hand that threatens and to court his own disgrace in league with macedon it rests with me to speak for those whose trust has been betrayed by him and in the name of india make reply why comes he here the king who sends you do we need the aid he offers with what countenance can he presume to shelter those who have no foe save him alone? Ere he laid waste the world in fury, India rested in repose. Or if some neighbor state ruffled her calm, she had no lack of children to defend her honor well. What means this fierce attack? What barbarous deed has roused your master's wrath? Did e'er a force of ours his realms invade? and ravaged ruthlessly those lands unknown so many countries deserts rivers lie between him and ourselves as well might bar all access even on earth's remotest verge can none escape the knowledge of his name and galling chains strange valor must be his that only seeks to injure and consumes all that its fires approach owning no rule but proud disdain he fain would make the world one prison all as many as we are of humankind slaves whom his foot may crush more lands more kings his sacrilegious hands range all men under the same iron yoke already he devours us in his greed 
of sovereigns once so many we alone are left to reign what say i we alone nay only i in whom there yet remain the traces of a king but at that thought my courage rises and well pleased i see this wide world shake that by my arm alone its freedom may be established if at all and that with peace restored all men may say great alexander would have tamed the world had he not met on earth's extremest bounds a king who broke her chains and set her free your resolution shows at least a heart valiant but tis too late to oppose the storm with no support but yours this tottering globe as well as you yourself must pity claim i will not try to hold you back march on against my master only i could wish you knew him better and that fame had told you at least the half of his achievements you would see what should i see what could i learn to make me fall at alexander's feet persia without an effort brought beneath his yoke your arms weary with shedding blood what glory was it to subdue a king nerveless already by soft ease enthralled to quell a nation sapless and inert whose golden harness made them sweat and groan who made no stand but prostrate fell in crowds till corpses only blocked your master's way dazed with his least exploits all other tribes came humbly on their knees to beg for terms and giving heed to oracles of fear thought it were impious to resist a god but we who conquerors scan with other eyes know well that tyrants are no deities so that however slaves may flatter him we deem the son of jupiter a man we go not forth to strew his path with flowers and everywhere he finds us arms in hand he sees his conquest stopped each step he takes here does a single rock cost him more lives more trouble more assaults almost more time than all the strength of persia's serried hosts the ease that was her ruin is to us hateful our native gold did ne'er corrupt our courage only glory tempts our hearts the sole possession i dispute with him tis that alone which alexander seeks to lower gains his soul is loath to stoop no other aim led him to leave his realms and to the throne of cyrus brought his steps shook the firm pillars of that mighty state armed his attack laid victory and crowns at his disposal since your pride rejects the proffered pardon glory does not grudge your eyes the witnesses of his success shall this day forth see how he fights for fame and sword in hand marches to victory go then and i will meet him ere he come scene three porus taxilus what so impatient will you then not so with your alliance will i meddle not hephaestion bitter only against me of your submission will inform his king the troops of axiana bound to me await the conflict ranged beneath my flag the honor of her throne will i support as of my own and you shall judge the fray let not your heart however in its zeal for your new friends kindle fresh flames of strife scene four axiana porus taxilus axiana to taxilus ah what is this they say of you our foes make it their boast that taxiles submits at least at heart nor marches against the king whom he respects the word of enemies is hardly to be trusted time will teach a better knowledge sir then give the lie to this insulting rumour and confound those who have uttered it like porus go force them to silence let them feel your wrath and learn they have no deadlier foe than you madam i go my army to array he lest these rumours that alarm you so porus performs his duty so will i scene five axiana porus that cold and sullen brow gives me no clue his craven bearing looks not that of king marching to victory whom i can trust we may not longer doubt we are betrayed he to his sister sacrifices name and country 
in his hatred he desires our downfall and but waits the battle hour to show it losing him i lose a prop unstable i have known him far too well to count on his support these eyes have seen his doubts unmoved dreading his feeble arm much more if raised for us a traitor fled to please his sister weakens us much less than cowardly resistance be not rash your valour reckons not the invading hosts almost alone hastening to meet his strokes you but oppose yourself to countless foes what would you have me prove a traitor too and out of terror give you up for slaves that i should stay within my camp confined and after giving challenge shirk the fight nay madam i believe it not but know too well that soul where glory's fire burns high can i forget whose were the potent charms that roused our princes all and drew them on to battle whose high spirits scorned to yield and none but alexander's conqueror would love that task be mine whereto i haste less to avoid his chains than merit yours madam i go ambitious to deserve bondage so sweet to conquer or to die and since my sighs appeal without avail to one whose heart glory alone can sway i will go forth to win a victory that shall attach such honour to my name that may from love of valour lead your heart perchance to love the victor go my lord it may be in the camp of taxiles there will be found men braver than himself to rouse them i will make a last essay thereafter share your fortune in your camp seek not to know the secrets of my heart live and enjoy a triumph this delay is needless madam why not tell me now if my entreaties move you can your heart suffer a hapless prince whose cruel fate perhaps condemns him ne'er to see again the idol of his soul to die without the proud assurance of a destiny so great what can i say queen of my soul if any tenderness you felt for me that heart which gives me promise of renown to be this day achieved might promise more a little love can it defend itself against such sighs can it march forth to meet the invader victory is yours if he resists no better than this heart of mine end of act two act three scene one axiana cleophila how is this madam am i prisoner here forbidden to behold my army march to battle is t with me that taxiles begins his treason thus in his own camp holding me captive this then is the fruit of all his sighs my humble worshipper become my master and already tired of my disdain despairing of the heart he binds the limbs nay but you construe ill the just alarm of one who ne'er succumbed save to your charms you with a kinder eye the zeal which makes your safety its concern while round us now two mighty armies stirred with equal ardour for the bloody fray make everywhere the sparks of fury fly in what direction would you guide your steps where could you find a shelter from the storm but here where all is calm and life is safe like tranquil port tis that tranquillity with its degrading safety i resent what when my subjects fighting for their queen and led by porus fall upon the plain sealing their faithful service with their blood when i can almost hear their dying cries they pray to me of peace and in his camp your brother keeps a posture of repose amid the tumult and insults my grief directing my sad eyes to sights of joy would you then madam that my brother's love should leave in danger's jaws a life so dear he knows too well the hazard and to turn my steps therefrom this generous lover makes his camp my prison whilst his rival risks life for my sake his valour is content to act the jailer happy porus how the shortest absence from him tries you sore with such impatience that you needs must search the field of battle to discover him 
I would do more. Yea, even to the tomb would follow him with ardour and with pride, lose all my realms, and see with eyes unmoved the victor pay therewith Cleophila for entrance to her heart. You need not go if you seek Porus. Soon will he be brought hither a captive. Let us guard for him so fair a conquest that his love has made. Already does your heart in triumph fly to Alexander, and his victory hail. But trusting to the flattering hopes of love your posts may prove a little premature you press your eager wishes somewhat far and count too soon upon your heart's desire yes now my brother comes and we shall learn whose the mistake has been no room for doubt longer remains that brow so satisfied has the defeat of porus written there scene two Taxiles, Axiana, Cleophila. Madam, had Porus been less choleric and followed the good counsel of a friend, he might indeed have spared my present pain in coming to announce his fate myself. Is Porus? All is over, and deceived by valor he is taken in the toils of which I warned him. Twas not that his arm, for to a fallen rival I'll be just, failed to dispute the victory right well making his foes pay dearly with their blood. Glory, attracted by his brilliant feats, between him and Alexander for a while wavered. But in his anger against me, at last he charged too hotly, and I saw his troops disordered, broken, turned to flight. Your soldiers routed and his own dispersed, saw finally himself carried along with them in their endeavors to escape. Too late of vain resentment, disabused, he longed for succor he refused before. Refused? What then? Your patriotic pride waits till entreaties rouse its energies. Against your will you must be forced to fight, else will you stir not even to save your realm. But to return to Porus, did he not speak by example with commanding voice? Could not his risk put courage in your heart, the danger of your mistress, and the state ready to perish? Go, you serve full well the master given you by your sister. Do what Urhus by dictates. Treat all alike, and let your mistress share your rival's chains. So well you worked, your crime and his defeat have placed that noble hero in my heart to be adored. Ere this day ends, I wish to make my love and hatred manifest, before your face to pledge myself to him, and in his presence swear immortal hate for you. Farewell and love me if you will now that you know me think not that my vows are faithless look for neither threats nor chains better does alexander know what's due to queens allow his kindness a free scope and keep a throne poor should never have placed in peril at all hazards i myself would wage fierce battle with the hand that touched objects so sacred what my sceptre then given by a foe must be upheld by you Shall the same tyrant set me on my throne, who came to drive me from it? Kings and queens, when fallen low before his conquering sword, have let his generous kindness soothe their woes. The wife and mother of Darius see, how like a brother does he treat the one, like son the other. Nay, I cannot sell my friendship, flatter tyrants, owe my crown to pity. Persia's women are too weak for me to copy. Think you I will haunt my victor's court, follow him through the world, and boast how light the chains he makes me wear? If he gives crown, let him give ours to you, and deck you, if he will, with borrowed plumes. Nor Porus nor myself will grudge you these, and you will be a slave much more than we. I hope that Alexander's pride, ere long vexed that your crime should stain his victory, will by your execution clear himself. Knaves such as you oft play the traitor twice. Let not his present favours dazzle you. Look you how Bessus suffered, faithless found. Farewell. Scene 3. Cleophila, Texiles. You may indulge her in this fury. Time and the conqueror's pleasure will conspire for your success. Her rage, say what she may, will not for long refuse to mount a throne. The master of her fortunes, you will be lord of her heart. But tell me, have you seen the victor? 
for what treatment may we look from him what said he sister i have seen your alexander such a youthful grace met my first glance as seemed to falsify the number of his feats my thoughts i own dared not connect such great renown with one so young but on that brow heroic pride was stamped his fiery eye and noble port told me twas alexander for his face infallibly proclaimed how great his soul and with a presence that supports his claims his eye is no less potent to command than is his arm his glory dazzled me fresh from the field and in his smile i read success on seeing me his pride forgot he made his goodness evident instead the triumph of the victor could not hide a lover's tenderness return he said prepare your sister's lovely eyes to see a conqueror who lays his victory and heart before her feet he follows close no more i leave you mistress of your fate to you entrust the conduct of my own if i have power you shall keep yours intact all shall obey you if the conqueror's ear be mine i go then see he comes himself scene four alexander Texilis, cleophila hephaestion go my hephaestion porus must be found take him alive and spare the vanquished all scene five alexander Texilis, cleophila alexander to Texilis. is it then true sir a misguided queen prefers the valour of a headstrong king to you but fear him not his realms are yours you have a prize to offer that may sway her passion sovereign of two kingdoms hers is in your hands go with your vows present three crowns you are too generous tis too much at leisure you may thank me for my care go where love calls you now nay linger not and let the palm of victory crown your flame scene six alexander cleophila madam his love shall have my firm support may i have naught who can do all for him so lavish of the fruits of victory toward him shall i have nothing for myself but barren fame sceptres restored or given into your hands friends crowned with mine own bays the honours i have won rained on their heads all show to other conquests i aspire did i not promise you my strong right arm should soon to your sweet presence bring me nigh forget not madam that you promised then to me a place within your heart i come the power of love has fought on my behalf and victory has herself redeemed my word when all around you see subdued tis time to yield yourself say would your heart withdraw the pledge it gave can it alone escape the conqueror of to-day who seeks but that my heart is not so stern as to remain invincible when all else owns your will i paid you honour to the glorious strength that holds a hundred nations at your feet to conquer india was your easiest task the firmest courage you inspire with dread and when you will your kindness in its turn will touch with gratitude the hardest hearts but ah my lord that valour and that grace oft wake within me trouble and alarm i fear lest you contented to have gained my heart should leave it in distress to pine that heedless of the passion you aroused your soul should scorn conquest so lightly won love lasts not long with heroes like yourself but glory ever has transporting charms and mid your amorous sighs it may well be to conquer still is all that you desire how little can you know the ardent love that wings those sighs with which i turn to you 
at other times i own amidst my troops my heart has panted only for renown peoples and kings subdued beneath my sway alone seemed worthy objects of concern persia's fair dames presented to my sight no better than her kings could vanquish me my heart armed with disdain against their shafts refused to render homage to their charms invincible twas glory it adored to love insensible it deemed its loss felicity till your dear tyrant eyes inflicted a new wound within my heart the pride of victory is its aim no more but glad it is to boast its own defeat blessed if your eyes melting in tenderness own in their turn the conquest they have won why will you always doubt their victory always reproach me with my warrior bays as though the pleasing fetters you impose were formed to bind none but ignoble souls on strange new exploits i am bent to show the power of love on alexander's heart this arm of mine pledged to your service now has to maintain your honor with my own the trump of fame shall tell in martial tones of nations to our world as yet unknown and there to you shall altars rise where none are raised by savage hands to gods themselves yes thither victory will follow you your captive but i have my doubts if love will do the same so many seas between may wash my image from your memory when ocean bears you on his stormy waves the whole world vanquished when that day arrives when you shall see all monarchs at your knees lie prostrate and earth trembling hold her peace before you will you think how a young queen unceasingly regrets you in the heart of her far distant realms and calls to mind how sweetly you assured her of your love what think you then that cruel to myself i can abandon here so rare a prize of beauty or will you yourself refuse the throne of asia that i offer you my lord you know that on my brother's will my own depends ah if my happiness is in his hands all india to his nod submissive soon for me shall intercede my love for him is free from selfish taint soothe i implore you an offended queen nor let a rival who this day has braved your anger prove more fortunate than he a noble rival porus was indeed never such valour won my high regard i saw him where the battle raged we met nor shunned he that encounter each one sought the other and so fierce a rivalry our quarrel would have soon decided when some troops that came between us made our strokes fall indiscriminate amongst the throng scene seven alexander cleophila hephaestion well had they brought that rash misguided prince all places have been searched but all as yet in vain look as they may his flight or death conceals the captive monarch from their eyes but in their flight a remnant of his troops surrounded stayed further pursuit awhile and seemed disposed to sell their lives full dear disarm but do not drive them to despair our task must be to bend this stubborn queen and thereby madam for my passion win your brother's favour and since on his peace my own depends let us make that secure End of Act Three. Act Four, Scene One, 
Exiana. Am I to hear these shouts of victory for ever ringing glory to my foes reproach to me? And may I not at least hold solitary converse with my woes? Incessantly pursued by one I hate, I care not for my life, try what they may to make me love it, while close watch they keep. But porous ne'er believe I can be stopped from following thee. Doubtless thy heart refused to outlive thy star, vain all their armed pursuit, thine efforts would thy presence have betrayed, so they must look for thee amongst the dead. Alas, when thou didst leave me, and thy love flooded thine heart, these ills that crush me now seem then foreseen, when into mine thine eyes gazed fondly, and besought to know thy place within my heart. A failure on the field thou didst not wreck, t'was love that caused thy fear. Why did I hide with many a subterfuge a secret which to know not vexed thy peace? How Oft thine eyes, making resistance weak, almost compelled my silence to give way. How oft, responsive to thy strong desire, e'en in thy presence heartfelt sighs escaped. But still I sought to doubt thy victory, as glory's incense to myself explained those sighs, and fancied that naught else I loved. Forgive! Today I feel I loved but thee. As many a time before, I own it now, glory possessed my soul, but I refrain from telling, as I ought, that it was thou didst fix my homage. Her I learned to know through seeing thee, and, ardent as I was, seen in another, should have loved her less. But, ah, what boots it to vent useless sighs, thou canst no longer hear, lost in the void! "'Tis time my soul, descending to the tomb, "'should pledge the love for which thou long didst yearn in vain, "'and, as a seal of faithfulness, "'show that this heart cannot survive its loss. "'Canst thou suppose that I could wish to live the conqueror's captive, "'to whose will thy death delivers us? "'I know he means to come to speak to me, "'and, giving back my throne, thinks to console me, thinks my hatred quelled may serve for trophy of his clemency. Ay, let him come, and he shall see me die a monarch to the last worthy of thee. Scene 2. Alexander, Exiana. Well, sire, and do you find some secret joy in seeing tears your arms have forced to flow? Or is it that you grudge me in my full freedom to weep alone with misery? Your grief shall be as free as it is just. Madam, you mourn a prince magnanimous. I was his foe, but need not therefore blame the tears devoted to the hero's death. Ere to her borders India saw me come, his brilliant virtues made him known to me. Conspicuous among earth's greatest kings, I knew... Why came you then with fierce attack? What led you from the world's remotest bounds in search of virtue to make war thereon? Can signal merit burst upon your sight and only move your pride to persecute? Yes, I sought Porus. But whate'er be said, I did not seek in order to destroy. I own that burning with ambitious fire I was attracted hither by his fame, and but to hear he was invincible made my heart eager for fresh enterprise. Whilst I was dreaming that on me alone, for many a gallant fight all eyes were set, I saw the valor of this warrior spread, till fame between us held her balance poised. When from his arm increasing terrors flew, India to me seemed to present a field deserving my best efforts, for I tired of kings, too feeble to resist, and heard with joy of such a brave and gallant foe to whet my courage. So I came to seek glory and danger. 
far did he surpass all i had heard and victory before so constant almost left my side to join your ranks the least success was hardly won and porus when he lost a battle saw his glory grow yet greater in defeat a fall so noble but exalts his fame not to have fought would vex his spirit more alas but he in patriotic zeal felt bound to cast away all care for life for harassed and betrayed on every side headlong he charged a multitude of foes but were it true his warlike ardour fired your soul and showed an open path to fame why with unworthy weapons did you fight were you obliged with cunning to oppose courage to wait upon another's will for his defeat and mar your fair renown triumph but be assured that in his heart already taxiles disputes with you the conqueror's glorious name and with some show of justice but for him the traitor boasts you would have won no bays this soothes my smart to see your glory shared by such as he your passion vainly strives to smirch my fame i ne'er was known to steal a victory and none can say that i subdue my foes not with the sword but guile and stratagem the coward's arts outnumbered everywhere yet never have i deigned to hide myself or owe my triumph to an ambuscade but in the light of day i fight and win with genuine grief i mourn your country's fate i would have spared your princes a defeat had they but followed my advice and wish i would have saved them or have fought them both believe me yes you are invincible is it not enough that all is in your power why must you cast so many kings in chains make with impunity the whole world groan what had so many captured cities done why is hithersbees cumbered with our dead what have i done to cause the overthrow of him who could alone attract my eye did he invade your borders deluge greece with blood what nations have been roused by us to rage and opposition against you your glory we admired we grudged it not charmed with each other with our thrones content we looked to find a happier lot than yours the only conquest porus wished to win was o'er a heart that might have owned him lord this day were his the only blood you shed that crime your only title to reproach would it not mar your happiness to feel you came so far to snap so fair a tie between our hearts nay flatter not your soul you are a tyrant nothing else i see your purpose madam to provoke my wrath to rise against you with outrageous taunts you hope perchance my kindness tried too far may violate its former character but if your virtue could exert no spell the conqueror is disarmed to your attack compassion moves me e'en against your will and i respect you in your deep distress it is this trouble that distorts your sight so that a hateful tyrant i appear else would you own the glory of my arms has not been always stained with blood and tears and you would see can i help seeing them those virtues which embitter my despair have i not seen your triumphs everywhere free from the insolence that stings the brave Scythians and Persians see I not well pleased to bear your yoke, and vaunt your clemency, eager to guard your person and supplant your people in a charge so coveted? But what does it avail the heart you wound everywhere else to hear your goodness praised? 
Can you expect my hatred to be soothed because the hand that tortures me is kissed by others? Can the kings that you have helped, nations content to serve you, give me back porous? No, sire. My hatred is increased by others' love, even though myself compelled to admiration. Earth's united voice shall not dictate to me, though none be found to share my hatred. I excuse the wrath that springs from love, yet well may be surprised. If common rumor has reported right, Porus no special favor won from you. Wavering in choice tween taxiles and him, whilst he yet lived, your heart refused to speak. But when he can no longer hear your voice, now for the first time you declare for him. Think you that conscious of your new-born flame, e'en in the tomb he claims it for himself? Load not yourself with unavailing grief. Cares more important summon you elsewhere. Sufficient tribute to his memory your tears have paid. Rain with fresh lustre shine, and to your stricken heart restoring peace, strengthen your realms, sore shaken by his fall. Choose them a master from so many kings, deeper in love than ever, Texiles, the traitor, prithee take a milder tone. He bears no stain of treason against you. Lord of his own dominions, he resolved to shield them from the thunderbolt of war. No oath, no duty bound him to leap down into the gulf where Porus chose to plunge. Think it is Alexander he himself that cares to advance your lover's happiness. Think how, united by so just a choice, Indus shall with Hydaspus own your sway. All shall be easy when your interests are my concern, and closely joined with those of Texiles. He comes. I do not wish my presence to embarrass him. His voice will best explain what, uttered by my lips, seems to offend. Lovers like solitude. I'll not disturb it. Scene three. Axiana Texilis. Mighty king, draw near, great monarch of the Indus. You have had your praise sung here, and I have been rebuked for anger against one who, it is said, would please me if he could, whose love is warmed by my cold treatment. I am urged, forsooth, to love you in return. Know you the task which I would set you, how to touch my heart? And are you ready? Madam, only prove what power so sweet a hope has over my heart. What must I do? He who would win my love must be in love with glory, as am I, interpret vows into fine feats of arms, and hate, as I do, Alexander's name. Into the midst of terrors he must march fearless, must fight and conquer, or be slain. Compare yourself with Porus, and decide which of the two is worthier of me. Yes, sir. My heart, that seemed to be in doubt, knew well the difference between a king and a base slave. I loved him, and I love. Since jealous fate forbids him to enjoy the sweet confession, I have chosen you as witness. Ever shall my tears revive his memory, and you shall see me place my only pleasure left in telling you of him. In vain my ardor seeks to warm a soul as cold as ice. Porus has set his deathless image there. Should I confront grim death to please you, I should please you not, unless I perished, nor can. My esteem may be regained. Wash out in foeman's blood your crime. Lo, fortune smiles. The hero's shade gathers his scattered troops beneath his flag, and seems the only power that can arrest their flight. Yours, too, ashamed of your commands, wear on their brows wrath and repentance writs for all to read. 
add fuel to the fire which now consumes them, and to us restore our freedom that begins to breathe again. Be the defender of your throne and mine, and let not porous weight find an heir. You answer nothing. By your face I see you lack the courage for so grand a scheme. The example of a hero calls in vain. You hug your chains. Leave me, and live a slave. This is too much. Madam, do you forget that if you force me to it, I may use the master's tone, provoked by your contempt beyond endurance? All you have is mine, and since my homage but inflames your pride, I shall be able. Yes, I know it well. I am your prisoner, and you fain would make my wishes captive too, till to your sighs my heart responds. Good. Cast away that mask of irksome mildness. Terrors be your aid. Speak with the tyrant's tongue ready to sting. Try all you can. I cannot hate you more. Deal not, I pray you, in mere idle threats. Your sister comes to prompt you in your part. Farewell. Her counsels and my wishes tend to the same goal, and you will help me soon to follow Porus. Nay, but rather... Scene 4. Taxilis Cleophila. Leave this thankless queen sworn to disturb your peace with deathless hate, who makes of your despair her sole delight. Forget. No, in my heart her image is enshrined. I worship her. Though all my sighs meet ceaseless enmity, in spite of your persuasion, her disdain, against my will, her must I ever love. Nor need her wrath surprise us. You and I have given her cause enough. Ah, but for you and your ill counsel which has been my curse, I should be now, if love not, less abhorred. I, but for you, defended by my care, my love without of porous, she might weigh in doubt, and would not that be happiness to make her for a moment hesitate? I can no longer live beneath her scorn. I must fall humbly at her cruel feet, or run with speed to execute her wrath, though aimed at Alexander or at you. I know the ardor of your mutual flame, but tis too much to sacrifice my peace for yours. Forget myself to give you joy. Nay, all must perish. May I but be blessed. Go, then, and to the battlefield return. Let not the flame die down that fires you now. Why lingers this inconstant courage here? Haste to the conflict. Porus waits for you. Is Porus living? Has he then appeared? Yes. His tremendous strokes too well attest this he. What happened he foresaw? His death being noised abroad held back the conqueror's arm, too credulous. He hither comes to wake their slumbering valour, triumph premature to check, and doubt it not, with love and rage inflamed to seize his mistress, or be slain before her eyes. Nay, more, Seduced by her, your camp breaks out in murmurs, well prepared to follow Porus. Oh, like a generous swain, succor your rival loved so tenderly. Farewell. Scene 5. Taxilis. Ha! Bent upon my ruin, fate calls back my dangerous rival from the grave. Again shall he be held those eyes whose tears mourned him, and dead preferred him yet to me. Tis more than I can bear. Let me but see what fortune offers, and with whom shall rest the glorious prize. Nor will I idly watch the issues from afar in feeble wrath. End of Act 4 Act 5, Scene 1 Alexander, Cleophila What? Feared you Porus after his defeat? My victory imperfect in your eyes? No, no my captive could not me escape trapped by my orders taken in the toils dread him no longer rather pity him i fear him most when most he pity claims brave as he was the fame he won in war troubled my mind far less than does his fall while at his back a mighty army marched their exploits and his own alarmed me not but now, unfortunate, a king discrowned, henceforth he will be ranged among your friends. No right has Porus now to such a place. For Alexander's hatred he has sought 
too far. He knows how loath I was to strike, but when I did, twas with as fierce a hate as he could wish. A warning shall he be to all the world. On him must I avenge the ills that war has wrought to prevent which was in his power. Tis his own act that brings its punishment, twice conquered, and by you hated. I cannot say I hate him, sire, and were I free to hearken to the voice of his misfortunes that appeal to me, I tell you he was greatest of our princes. His arm was long the stay of all our states. He wished, perhaps, in marching against you, to show at least that he deserved to fall under no stroke but yours, that the same field might bring renown to both, and link his name with Alexander's. But such warm defence would wound my brother and destroy his hopes. So long as Porus lives, what can he be? Ruin must needs be his, and mine as well it may be. For his love, obtaining naught, will hold me guilty, fit for punishment. E'en now your heart is fluttering for new flights of conquest through the world. When I shall see the Ganges roll his flood between you and him, who will restrain my brother's unjust wrath, my lonely soul will languish far from you. Alas! Should he condemn my sighs to cease, what would become of this poor heart of mine, the conqueror to whom I gave it? gone madam enough if you have given your heart tis mine command your brother as he will to guard more safely than those vanquished lands which i have kept only to offer you one conquest more then dearest i return thenceforth my sole ambition to be king over your soul and yet myself obey, placing within your hands my destiny and all mankind's. Ready to bear my yoke, the Malian awaits me at the verge of ocean where I need but show myself as conqueror of the world and of your heart, when the proud element— What? War on war? Seek you for subjects in beyond the earth, and lands to their inhabitants unknown? Must they bear witness to your brilliant deeds? What foes do you expect neath skies so rude? They will oppose you with their desert wastes, sunless and solitary, where nature's self seems to expire. And there, perchance, may fate and ambush lie to seize you, venting thus the secret envy that has tried in vain to cloud your grand career, Resolved at least that dumb forgetfulness shall dig your grave. Must you drag then the remnants of a host that twenty times has perished, twenty times has been renewed? A hundred battlefields have swallowed half the troops you lately led. Those that survive claim pity, and their groans. I have but to prepare them for their march, and they will follow me with hearts revived however they murmur in an idle camp, and count their wounds. Soon they will blame themselves, and beg me to expose them to fresh blows. Let me, meanwhile, support your brother's suit. His rival can no longer cross his love. Have I not spoken? And again I say— Here comes the queen, my lord. Scene two, Alexander, Axiana, Cleophila. Well, Porus lives. Madam, it seems that heaven has heard your prayers and given him back to you. Nay, rather say takes him for ever from me, nor can hope allay my present pain. His death before was doubtful, now tis sure. He dares the worst to see me once again, or give me help, helpless himself, alone against the host. In vain his gallant efforts caused alarm at first. In vain a few brave warriors, nerved by his bold courage, scared the victor's camp. He must succumb, and, valiant to the last, fall on the heaps of slain that bar his way. 
oh, could I only, making my escape, show myself there, and die before his eyes! But Axilles, the traitor, holds me fast, and goes himself, meanwhile, to feast his eyes upon his rival's blood, and see him lie low in the arms of death, if so he dare to meet him. Madam, by my care his life is saved, and soon shall his return content your heart's desire. You shall see him. What? Can your care reach to him? And shall the arm that crushed him be his stay, the conqueror's hand give safety? Yet what wonder is too great, issuing from such a source? I call to mind how that you said you hold the vanquished foe a foe no longer, and that Porus was never your foe at all, that glory armed yourself and him alike, him prompt to try his courage against yours, you to attack, but not destroy. The scorn that braved my wrath doubtless deserves a conqueror more severe. His pride in falling seems to gather strength, but I have ceased to be his enemy, and cast off hatred when I drop that name. Of his reward shall Texiles be judge, to ruin or to spare, as seems him best. In short, it is to him you must appeal. What? Go and beg for mercy at his feet? Send to make proof how kind is Taxiles. If Porus must solicit such support, surely your hatred has decreed his death. Twas his destruction after all you sought. How easily a generous soul is duped! Too credulous and ready to forget virtues in you I praised which were not yours. Arm yourself then, my lord, with cruelty, as a mere butcher end your grand career, and, having raised so many fallen foes, destroy the one whom most you sought to spare. Strange love for Porus yours, that will not stoop to save his life, but scorns my proffered boon, and brands me as a jealous hypocrite. Well, if he dies, accuse yourself alone. I see him coming, and shall learn his will. His judgment, Porus, shall himself pronounce. Scene 3. Porus, Alexander, Axiana, Cleophila, Hephaestion, Alexander Scarts. Well, Porus, so your pride has borne its fruit. Where is the fair success that lured you on? Your soaring spirit is at last cast down. Offended majesty a victim claims. Nothing can save you. Yet will I once more offer a pardon many times refused. This queen rebels against my clemency thinks constancy more precious than your life. Would have you die without a moment's doubt, so long as to the tomb you bear the name of her true lover. Pay not such a price for boast so vain. Live, and let Taxiles be happy. Taxilis. Yes. I approve your care so well bestowed. What has he done for you deserves no less. T'was he that snatched victory from me, gave you his sister, sold his honor, me betrayed. What can you do one service out of all to recompense? But I already have forestalled your care. Go, see him die upon the battlefield. Taxiles. What is this? Yes, sire, he's dead having himself tempted the stroke of fate. Porus, though vanquished, still surrenders scorned and seemed attacker rather than attacked. His soldiers, fallen, wounded to the death, sheltered him with their bodies where they lay, and there, as if within a fort enclosed, gainst our whole host, he bravely stood at bay, and with an arm that fear and slaughter dealt, our boldest warriors foiling, held his post. I meant to spare him, 
His fast failing strength would soon have placed his life within my power. When to fatal field rushed Taxiles. Let be, he cried. I claim this captive mine. Porus, your hour is come and death is sure. Perish, or yield the queen to me. He spoke, and Porus, at that voice rekindling rage, lifted an arm wearied with many a blow, while with his eye he sought him proud and calm. Is that the faithless Taxiles I hear? The traitor to his country, he exclaimed. To his mistress and to me. Come, coward, come. Yes, Axion is yours, my prize I yield. But your stout arm must take my life as well. Approach. Thereat the infuriate rivals rushed to deadly conflict. We, as best we could, to their encounter all our force opposed. But Porus carves a passage through our ranks, meets Taxiles, and with a single thrust pierces his heart. Then, satisfied, his sword surrenders. For my brother I must weep. On me, my lord, your arms with all their weight have fallen. Vainly sought he your support. Alas, your glory has but wrought his death. Can Alexander's friendship help him now? But will you see him to the grave descend, all unavenged, while his assassin boasts before his sister's eyes and yours, my lord? Let Alexander to her tears attend. She has my sympathy, for with good cause she mourns a brother, whom she strove in vain to save by making him a coward first. It was not Porus who attacked, was he the traitor that confronted his just wrath why in the battle's tumult did he mix came he to snatch him from the conqueror's grasp nay but when all was lost to overwhelm a king who from his victors won respect but why deprive you of a pretext urged so plausibly her brother has been slain by porus tis enough with generous blood appease his ghost and so avenge yourself. But I, too, share his crime. Yes, Porus, yes, my heart is yours, as Alexander knows. Your rival knew it to his cost. From you alone I kept it. The last joy I feel is to declare it to yourself. Tis time that Alexander should be satisfied. Fear Porus, who, though vanquished, yet could do as you have heard who, by your troops hemmed in, revenge defeat, whose name can raise fresh foes and wake from sleep a hundred fettered kings. Quench in my blood these dangerous sparks of war. Then go, and safely conquer all the earth that's left. But think not that a heart like mine can thank a conqueror, and forgo its rights. Speak, and without expecting me to soil my honor, let us see how you can use your victory. Is that proud spirit still unbroken, Porus? And will your last breath be spent in threatening words? Victory herself must fear such pride. Your name is still worth more than armies. I must take security. Tell me then how to treat you. Like a king. Well, like a king's, then, shall your treatment be. I will not leave my victory incomplete. Tis your own wish, nor will you raise complaint. Porus, reign on. I give you back your crown. And with my friendship, Axiana, take. To welcome bonds I thus condemn you both. Live both and reign. Alone of many kings, far as the Ganges' banks your rule extend. To Cleophila. Such treatment, madam, may surprise you. But tis thus that Alexander wreaks revenge. I love you, and my heart touched by your sighs, with your displeasure would not weigh the lives of thousands. But a gallant warrior's death, disarmed and captive, would yourself offend. Porus would triumph in a bold contempt for all my harshness, 
and to the grave descend victorious. Let me end as I began, and bring you generosity unstained as my best gift. Let Porus take his crown restored by me, and you yourself shall reign o'er all the world besides. Grace well the throne with goodness as with beauty. Make your sway noble as well as brilliant from the first, and let a sister's anger be forgot. Yes, madam, reign, and suffer me to esteem the greatness of the hero who has given his heart to you. Love him, and see the world adore him, prize so sweet a privilege. Sire, until now, the dread of all mankind forced me to admire the fortune of your arms. But mid the widespread terror, I could see in you no virtues that surpassed my own. I bow submissive now, and own myself vanquished by one whose magnanimity equals his valor. Go, subdue the world to your obedience. It shall see me lend support to all your exploits. I am yours and will do all I can to give to it so great a master. What can heart so sad as mine say to my lord? Shall I repine because to pour us Alexander deigns both life and scepter to restore? He knows what best becomes his glory. Press me not for further speech. In silence let me weep. Yes, madam. I too mourn a faithful friend and fervent sorrow finds relief in sighs. A splendid tomb shall tell a future age of my remembrance and of your regret. End of Act 5 End of Alexander the Great by Jean Racine Translated by Robert Bruce Boswell